if you're wondering what the hell the long intro is all about, one, your lecturer has a bad running habit, two, we're kicking off counting processes today, and it just so happens that the best metaphor for trying to explain how counting processes work is a marathon. So let's jump in. Right, so we begin by formally defining a counting process. Now I know for some of you this might be a, a bit overreaching, you know, formally defining the concept of counting, uh, but as usual, we need to make clear what we're talking about when we transfer uh, concepts to paper in mathematical language. In any case, later on in your postgraduate career, you'll see that counting process models actually can be quite formidable animals to work with. So here goes. Stochastic process, which is just a set of random variables, nt, such that t is greater than or equal to naught, is a counting process if and only if nt denotes the total number of events that have occurred up to time t. Okay, so again, bit on the nose, but there you go. So let's look at some properties of a counting process. Then. Well, first, nt is a non-negative integer-valued random variable. Okay, so this is a discrete process. We're counting things. Two, if s is some time less than time t, then, well, ns is less than or equal to nt. So that is, the count at time s is less than or equal to the count at time t. That is, nt, the counting process, is non-decreasing. So it can only go up, can't go down. 3. For some time s less than time t, count at time t minus the count at time s is the number of events that have occurred in the interval running from s to t. Okay, and that makes intuitive sense. If the count is 5 at time s and 10 at time uh, t, then, well, the difference between those is the number of events that have happened in that interval running from s to t. Simple as that. Now note here that the count process may increase at any point in the continuum of time, so we don't restrict the process to change or occupy states at discrete points in time like we do for a Markov chain. Uh, we give it freedom to increment at any point in time. So this is a continuous time process. So continuous time, discrete state process. Cool. Now, before we jump into the probability models for counting processes, it's worth having a look at how one captures data for such processes. So you have a clear idea of what the nomenclature that we'll be using actually refers to. So, when we observe real-world processes, um, maybe observe events of interest and then record the times at which they occur. Okay, so we're counting things, we observe them, and then we write down the time. Okay, so in tab tabular form, a natural way to do this uh, would be, for example, just to have one column dedicated to the event number. So we'll have events one, two, three, four, etc. And then we just write down the time at which those events occur. Okay, the times. So T1, T2, T3, where those are the specific times at which you observe the events. And then for good measure, what we do is we also record the time since the last event occurred for each observation. Okay, why we want to do that? Well, we want to maybe check whether those are statistically related or, you know, how they change over time. That will become important for modeling things, as you will see later. Also, another thing we might want to do is you know, keep track of the class of event, if that is actually um, relevant to the problem that we're working on. So, for example, if we're counting supernovae, I mean, what type of supernovae are you, are you observed? Have you observed for each, uh, each observation? Something like that. Okay, so in the world of counting processes, uh, we also give special names to the features of each data point here. So we each data point is a row on this table. Um, and the features I'm referring to are the columns. Okay, so things we, types of things that we write down. Okay, and the first is obviously the count, and that's just NT, right? That's the counting process we're interested in. Um, the times at which we observe these, we refer to these as arrival or waiting times. Okay, why? Because, well, we wait for so long until we observe the first event, the second event, etc. And we maybe we want to refer to these as well as the first arrival, the second arrival, etc. Okay, and then the inter-arrival times are actually sort of self-explanatory. And then the class of event, that just remains the same. Okay. Now, another thing to note here is, um, you know, it, it would have obviously been very natural for the elements in this table um, to refer to the arrival times um, using notation ti for some index i, running 1, 2, 3, etc. 
Um, but what we actually do is we reserve SI for some index I for the arrival times and then use TI for the inter-arrival times. Okay. Reason we do this is, well, it's got to do with what letters we assign to the random variables for the arrival and inter-arrival times. And it'll become obvious why we pick these uh, that way around. So it can be confusing. Sorry for the overlap in notation, but that's how it goes. Cool. Now note here that the count is what we're modeling, right? So if you're looking at this table and you're a bit confused about that, because, well, if you look at that column, you'll see that, well, it just goes one, two, three, four, five, and I told you it can only go up. So that seems a bit predictable, right? But uh, keep in mind that in the real world, um, what we do is we typically observe processes for a fixed window of time. So let's say we have a fixed window, zero to capital T. Um, well, then that means that the number of events that happen in that window will be random. Okay, so actually the total number of rows in this table will be random. Okay, and we're modeling the count, and as you'll see, we'll probably be modeling the number of events that occur in a particular fixed window. And then also the other random component we need to keep track of is obviously the arrival times. Those are actually random, right? And also the inter-arrival times. Okay. So where's the running metaphor in all of this? Okay, well, let's have a look at the timesheets for my favorite marathon. Okay, and this is the Yimmel and Arda marathon, uh, which we ran at the start of 2020. So this is obviously pre-COVID and everything, um, but let's have a look. Okay, so how does the race work? Uh, well, the organizers set a course, uh, which starts in Caledon and finishes in Hermanus. Okay, then gather the branch of uh, marathoners, and they say, okay, we're going to set you off at, say, I don't know, 6 a.m., and then we'll check how long it takes you to get back down to Hermanus. Okay, so they go and set up some timing instrument, they set off the runners, and then they wait until you cross the finish line and write down the time it takes you to do so. Okay. So they go and sit down at the finish line, and then the first person arrives. So the first count, if we're counting runners, arrives. And that was Jimmy Bonisi, uh, and he did so in 2 hours, 28 minutes, and 52 seconds. He's a veteran runner from, a uh, veteran male runner from the Brinstone Iteco Sports Athletics Club. Okay, brilliant. So first arrival time, 2 hours, 28 minutes, 52 seconds. Okay, we wait a couple of more minutes. Um, and then you see, okay, see a Bonga Sakawe um, crosses the finish line in 2 hours, 32 minutes and 10 seconds. So second arrival, 2 hours, 32 minutes and 10 seconds. And he's a senior runner, so actually a bit younger um, than Jimmy. And um, he's from Nethban Nedbank Athletics Club. Okay, so we have some categorical information as well. Okay, I can see it sort of continue, right? So third runner, fourth runner, fifth runner, etc. Okay, so if we're counting runners... We write down the time at which they cross the finish line, and that's our counting process. Okay, simple as that. Now, obviously, you can have a look at this and you can say, well, okay, yes, uh, I agree. Maybe the times at which they cross the finish line are random. But again, look at the count. The count is progressing uh, um, sort of systematically. It's going one, two, three, four, as one should expect. Indeed. So where's the random bit in that? Well, because the times are random, Okay, if we fix the time window over which we actually observe things, then we expect the number of people to cross the finish line in that window to be random as well. Okay, so let's say, for example, we said, okay, we're going to put a cutoff time at, I don't know, um, three hours, 30 minutes, so three and a half hours. Okay, we'll stop recording. And then we'll count how many runners have crossed the finish line within that window of time. Okay, so let's go through the timesheets. Okay, so the first page has 50 runners. The last person crossed in 314, so still under the um, under the cutoff time. Second page, uh, another 50 runners, so there's at least 100. Okay, so still under the three and a half hour mark. Okay. Um, third page. Okay, so yeah, we're gonna close, and we'll see that. Okay. The last person to cross the finish line under the three and a half hour ma mark was uh, Nickaberry Stain, and he was the 119th person to cross the finish line. Okay, so if we have a fixed window of time, we actually see that, well, the count, the number of people to cross the finish line in that time window is also random. Okay, and that follows since the times at which they cross the line are, are random. Okay, 
Cool. So, why are count process models useful? Well, if we can actually model a process like this, we can use the raw data here and actually do this, I've done this. Um, we can actually model how, you know, we can build a probability model for how people cross the finish line. We can actually make predictions. So we can could have, for example, predicted, you know, what is the number of people that we expect to cross the finish line within three and a half hours? Another thing we could have done is maybe see, okay, uh, what is the probability that someone from, uh, I don't know, VOB Athletics Club crosses the finish line before someone from uh, ATC Athletics Club, for example? Okay, so sort of check, well, what is the probability that one arrival time is less than another? Things like that. Um, maybe you're interested to see, well, how far am I going to be beaten by my friends? You sort of look at the inter-arrival times between you and your friends, given categorical information, things like that. Okay, and that's why it's useful. Okay, so this is a running timesheet, um, and I hope it's obvious now why I say that, that sort of running timesheet is almost the perfect metaphor for explaining how count processes work. But this format actually applies to how we um, you know, capture data for other counting processes as well. And uh, we can use the raw data in a similar fashion to actually model such processes and make predictions. Okay. So, yeah, again, I hope it's obvious why the run in metaphor is so good for counting processes. Okay, so last two introductory concepts that we need to cover um, before we get into the theory or that of independent increments and stationary increments. Okay, these will show up a number of times as we go through the theory. Okay, and they are as follows. A counting process has independent increments if the numbers of events occur in disjoint intervals of time are independent. Okay, so if you have two disjoint intervals, so non-overlapping intervals, um, then the distribution of the counts in those intervals are statistically independent. Okay, that's what independent increments mean. It's a very important concept. That will, again, simplify a lot of the, mathematic that we'll, the mathematics that we'll be doing. Next. A counting process has stationary increments if the distribution of the number of events occurring in any time interval depends only on the length of that interval and not where it is in time. Okay, so that is um, the count over some interval, say, running from S plus A to S plus B, has the same distribution as the count over some interval uh, running from A to B, okay? Um, and this should hold for all S, okay? So if you think of S again as some reference point in time, that says that, well, for A and B fixed, the distribution does not change with respect to the reference point, okay? Uh, it only depends on the length of that interval, okay? So the difference between A and B might have an effect on the distribution, but not where it is in Okay, so that concludes it for the intro to counting processes. Um, there are no homework problems since we didn't really cover any theory. This is very much a conceptual intro. Um, so I'll see you in the next one.